High upon this mountain, the sun is shining bright. My heart is filled with gladness here above the cares of life. But I've just come through the valley of trouble, fear, and pain. It was there I came to know my God enough to stand and say even in the valley God is good even in the valley he is faithful and true he carries his children through like he said he This road of life has led you to a valley of defeat. You wonder if the Father has heard your desperate plea. There is hope in that rugged place where tears of sorrow dwell. Can't you hear him gently whispering, I'm here and all is well. Even in the valley, God is good. Even in the valley, he is faithful and true. He carries his children through like he said he would. God is good. He is good. Even in the valley, God is good. Even in the valley, He is faithful and true. He carries His children through like He said He God is good, even in the valley, God is good. Yeah. Amen. How many believe today that God is good? Would you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. I want to praise him that even in the valley, uh, even when we have absolutely no idea what is going on around our life or in our life, God's still good. Amen. Uh, and I want to praise him. Even when we don't have the answer, God's still good. Even when we can't see, guess what? God's still good. Even when we fail, God's still good. Amen. How many of you believe he's good? 
Amen. I praise the Lord uh, this morning for his goodness and thank God uh, for his wonderful grace and his mercy and his love and the peace that God gives. I'm glad that he's able to give a peace, the Bible says, uh, that passes all understanding. I want to praise him this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter number 2. Uh, the book of Philippians in the New Testament chapter number 2. Uh, you can also follow along on the uh, Pooh's Chapel app if you have that under sermon notes. Uh, I want you to look at uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse, uh, we're going to look at some verses of scripture here, we're starting in verse number 5. Uh, we are looking through and studying through, uh, together as a church, uh, this little book called I Will. Uh, Lord willing, today we are on chapter 1 and if it uh, continues, uh, we're going to be on chapter 2 next week and then chapter 3 the next week and then chapter for the next week, so uh, that way you can keep up with it. If you have not uh, got your copy, please do so at our uh, at our welcome center. Uh, but we're we're thinking about how, as a Christian, are you a Christian today? What is a Christian? What's the definition of a Christian? A follower of the Christ, a follower of Jesus, not somebody, not just a religion, not just church, not just having religious activities, but somebody who listens to Jesus and obediently we follow him. Our first step in following him is having a relationship with him, and that does not just happen. We're not born a Christian. We're not born into Christianity. We are born again by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross and forgives all of our sins and makes us brand new. Amen? And so we are. How we become a Christian, but then as we become a Christian and we are saved, how then we are to follow him. Sometimes it gets to the place in our life that we're no longer an I will follower. It is very easy to become the one who sits in the wagon. How many remember whenever you was a kid? Anybody here ever been pulled in a wagon before? Anybody? Raise your hand. All right. Whenever I was a kid, I had a wagon, and I'm going to be real honest with you. I had a cousin who was my neighbor. We, if, if monster trucks were real in that day, I had a monster truck wagon. We would work on that thing, jack it up, put big wheels on it. We run, we, that thing went hundreds of miles with my mama screaming. We would ride it down hills, straight down hills. Anybody ever been there before? We just wanted to see what that thing would do. It was a wagon. It'll do anything, amen? So when I think about our life as a Christian, sometimes as a Christian we get to the place where we want to sit in the wagon and let somebody else pull. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You ever just took the easy chair, has a... It is easier for me just to be here and let somebody else do what I do the work and do what needs to be done. And all I want to do is just be blessed and I just want to hear things and I just want to worship. And I just, that is part of worship is whenever I say I will. It is taking my life from I want to becoming an I will follower. I want to tell you something about being an I want or an I Christian that looks and wants everything for me, everything my way. I want to tell you what's going to happen in our life as a Christian when we become an I want Christian. I want my way. I want my things. I want to tell you what's going to happen. Y'all ready? Look at somebody and say, here we go. You are going to be miserable. We are going to be in that place when we want to be served as a Christian to where our Christianity loses joy. We looked at a little bit of that how last week we become unhappy. So I want to ask you a question before we go any further in Scripture and any further in this message. Where am I going in my life? What do I want to accomplish as a Christian? We establish what a Christian is. It is a follower of who? 
of Christ. We know that. So now what am I going to do with that? What is that going to look like in my life? So how do I see what God can do and what God wants to do in my own life? I want to tell you you can look around in the world, how you can look around everywhere. The only place you and I are going to know what God wants to do in our life is in his word. Where we're going to find it? In his word, the word of God. Oh, is, is the church important to me? When I think about the church and Christ, how Christ established the church, he died for the church, he loved the church so much, he gave himself for it. So how does that work in my life? And so we're looking at how I will as it comes to following Christ in his body, in the church, in the local church. Also, what is my relationship to the church. Jesus has saved me now. Oh, what do I do? This relationship that I now have with Christ is to love him with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul, with everything within me. I'm to love him. I want to ask you something this morning. Do you love Jesus? Wow. I'm glad the Bible says I can love him because he first loved me. I want to tell you, there was a time in my life that I did not love Jesus. I knew that he died for me. I knew that he was, I knew all those things that I had heard, but I really, I'm going to be real honest with y'all, I really didn't care. But boy, I'm glad he saved me one day. I'm glad the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and brought me into that relationship and said, I want you to know that you are loved by God Almighty and Jesus loves you so much that he shed his blood on a cross just for you. And wow, it is that love that changes everything in our life. Oh, he does love us. When you, uh, when you become a Christian, here's what happens. There is a spiritual marriage that takes place. If you are saved, according to Ephesians uh, chapter number 5, you have now uh, become the bride of Christ. He is the groom. We are uh, the bride, and we are to walk uh, together, to serve uh, together, to be, uh, to be what God would have us to be. In that spiritual marriage, it has to be cultivated. How it is that place where we uh, are along with him, we speak with him, oh, we worship him, we allow the word uh, to, uh, to bring us uh, together. We speak to him. That is that time a prayer he speaks to us through his word and through the power of the Holy Spirit that relationship of a believer to the church is in that same way that we are a, a married that we are together that we are walking together in God's grace listen I want to tell you I want which means I want my way my things my will can ruin a marriage did y'all know that Everybody look up this way. I won't can ruin your marriage. It's I will. That will change everything. And so in my relationship with Christ, it is I want or I will. How when Jesus came, John chapter number 13, he tells his disciples, he said, I want you to know something about where I am and who I am. I know I'm the Savior of the world. I know I am God in the flesh, but I am come. I'm not so you can minister to me, but I am come so that I can serve you. I will serve. Wow, when we watch in, in Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, number 5 is we're going to look. And whenever we take our I want and it becomes I will, look in verse uh, number 5 with me. Look in uh, Philippians 2 and verse number 5. He said, let this mind be in you, uh, which was also in who? Christ Jesus he said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon them the form of a serpent, uh, of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And verse number 8 said, and being found in fashion as a man, he did what? Humbled himself and became what? Obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. So watch Jesus as he takes in life that place where he understands he is going to the cross. He had to put this flesh under 
subjection to the power of the Holy Spirit, to, to who God is, to God's will and God's way and God's desire. Here's what Jesus said. It's found in the book of Hebrews. He said, he said it like this. He said he despised the cross, but he went through the cross for the joy that was set before him. Wow. We looked last week at the simple thing of in that place of changing our perspective of where we are in the church and what God is doing in the church and what God is doing in our life, that place where we become un happy. I will or I want what I want. Or whenever I say I will, I serve. When I say I want, I am looking up to be served. Can I just tell you something about our generation? Look at somebody and say, yep. I'm going to tell you about our generation. We want to be served. We want everything like we want it. We want it when we want it. We want it like we want it. Y'all know what I mean? We want it just exactly precise, and if it's not, we are totally upset. Can I just let y'all know something? How we are living in a world that is in great disappointment. We're living in a world that is in great depression. We're living in a world that is in a great distress. And they are in that place where life is so discouraged because every little thing does not work out exactly like they think that it should. And it even happens in our Christian life how to where we get to that place. It's like, wow, I want to be served. I want every little thing just like I want it or I am not going to do it. Now I want you to look this morning at this simple place of challenging myself. I want to tell you, we have the answer for everybody else. Look at, look at your neighbor right now, the one you haven't looked at yet because you're mad at him. No, I'm just kidding. Look at your neighbor right now and say, I know what's wrong with you. I know what your problem is. Oh, I want to tell you, it is very, very easy to know what everybody else's problem is. But what about us? He said, let this mind that is in Christ be in you also. So if I look at people and understand people, and not from my perspective, but from who Jesus is, is it going to change my life? If I look at something in church as Jesus would look at it, as Jesus would see it, as Jesus would know it, what does it look like? Wow, we are challenging ourselves. We will never grow until we challenge ourselves. We will never grow spiritually until we challenge ourselves. Until I say, yes, I'm going to read the word. Yes, I'm going to pray. Yes, I'm going to repent of this sin. Yes, I'm going to follow Jesus everywhere. It is that challenge in our life. We began this last Sunday when we talked about unlocking the door. How am I going to unlock the door in my own life to becoming an I will believer? The Bible tells it like this, and it's in Revelation 3 and verse number 20, which we gave last Sunday as our invitation verse. Jesus said it like this. He's talking to the church of Laodicea. You know what the church of Laodicea said? They said, we have everything and we really don't need anything. They became blind to their I want. They had all the gold, they had all the silver, they had every, all the money they needed. They had all the things worked out. They were doing church. By the way, you can, did you know you can do church without Jesus? It's easy just to get in a routine, amen? It's easy just to walk through instead of saying, God, we need the fellowship with you, and Lord, how we need you. Wow, when we look at what Jesus said, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, I want to ask you a question. Anybody in here ever had anybody to knock on your door at your house or ring your doorbell? If you have, would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. Used to, it was this. And then it was, ding dong. And now it's, and you can see them. 
When they knock on your door, they're knocking on your door for a reason. They are there because there's a communication that needs to happen. And the Bible says that Jesus said, I'm knocking on your door. I want to fellowship with you. I want to know you. Why does he want to do that? It's because we are married. It is because we are to walk together. It is because we are to fellowship together. It is because he wants to love us like we are designed to be loved by him. Well, the Bible tells us some things, and we watch as we talk about and look at how what is going on in our life and fellowship with Him. And one one thing about unlocking this door is our attitude. This is a Sunday morning crowd. This is that place in our life. Y'all ever watch people at church? When we get our new camera, it's going to have a thing. It's going to shine this way. We're going to span this thing. It's like, when is he going to shut up? The attitude. Did you know your attitude makes all the difference? Do you know your attitude shows a lot about who that we are? The Bible says it like this, and it's found there in Philippians chapter number 2 where you are, and verse number 2 where he says, I fulfill ye have the joy, my joy, how we are to have a joy. Oh, listen, I want to tell you how when you look at what he said, he said, fulfill ye my joy, how that you may be like-minded. Oh, and then he said, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Wow, I have never understood this. Look at somebody and say, no, he can't figure it out. I have never understood how people in church can be mad at each other and never speak to each other. I cannot figure that out. Amen. Can y'all? If we have the same, y'all must have got her figured out. Y'all ain't saying nothing. How about writing that down and sending it up here to text me? Praise the Lord. I want to tell you, it is totally unbiblical. Amen. You cannot have the same Jesus, the same Holy Ghost in your life and be mad at each other. Right. Woo! Praise the Lord. He said, I want you to know what is my attitude toward each other? What is my attitude toward the church? Wow. Have you ever experienced anything at church that you didn't like? Would you raise your hand? Something you didn't like? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Woo. Guess what? We are all in the same boat. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to be real honest with y'all, can I? I really don't come for what I like or don't like. I really don't come to see what somebody's clothes, how they are or how they're not. I really don't even check and see if they bust their teeth. I really do not care. What I want to know is, is Jesus here? And are we going to follow him? And am I going to be concerned enough in my own life to say, God, whatever you want to do in my life, you do it. God, but however you want to speak to me, speak to me. God, however you want to change me, change me, God. I am here in your holy presence for you. Oh, it is that attitude. There's about four things right quick about attitude. Number one, a right attitude will produce joy because it is biblical. Biblically, it comes biblically induced. When you and I come and we follow Jesus and we are in church because of who Jesus is, because we want to worship Jesus, because we want to honor Jesus, I want to tell you what it will do. It will produce joy in our life. Wow. Whenever we look and we are, how we recognize in our life, I recognize also in my attitude that no church is perfect. Did you know there's not a church that's perfect? I hate to, I, hate, I really hate to bother you. I hate to, I hate to even put this in your mind. But Poovey's Chapel's not perfect. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to say that. We're not perfect. You know why? Because we're in it. And we're not perfect. 
We don't always have the right attitude. We don't always do the right things. But I want to tell you what, when you are doing things and you're following Christ and you are trying to do what God wants you to do, there's two things you need to understand. Number one, is it godly? Is it in the Bible? Number two, does it have sin in it? Oh, listen, I want to tell you the greatest, if you and I, we try and we walk and we do things as a church, if we fail or they fail, if we have given the word in that, we have not failed. The Bible said it like this. He said in Isaiah 55, he said, I want to let you know something about my word. It will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I have sent it to you. Our attitude about who God is and what God it will unlock the door in our lives for following him. The third thing about our attitude is we need to acknowledge that no pastor, no church member, no staff member, no church staff is perfect. Y'all do know I'm going to make mistakes. I'm a person. That's not an excuse Man, I want to follow Jesus. I want to please Jesus. But I want to tell you what, I'm not perfect. Amen? If you got anybody set up as a perfect person, you are going to fail. Your I wants are going to be very disappointed. Oh, listen, it's when we say, God, I will. I want to follow you. I want to see what you are doing. How the fourth thing is in our attitude, it is I serve anyway. Who am I here for? What am I doing at church? I am serving God. So God, what do you want me to do? I will. There's something that just caught my eye, and I want to I give you this right quick, and it is, it was found in, in, in chapter 1. It says, your attitude determines who you are. Have you ever thought, I've heard people say, you need to get rid of the attitude. Well, attitude can be happy. You want me to get rid of that? No, an attitude. I know what we are saying when we say that because most time we address somebody's attitude, it's because it's bad, amen? But here's a little, here's the, your attitude determines who you are. I am jealous, that's an attitude. I, or I'm joyous, that's an attitude. I am angry, that's an attitude. I am grateful, that's an attitude. Wow. Do you know you choose your attitude? But your attitude comes from where you are plugged into. Today, right now, right this second, look, look what I'm going to say right now. If I had a drop cord, and it had the end that plugs in first, and the other end had the three wires on it sticking out. Y'all ready? And you took that drop cord, and you plugged it in the wall, and these three wires are just sitting there like this and you just touched your neighbor with it, do you think it would change their attitude? <laughs> Amen? Hey, can I let you know something? What you're plugged into will guide your attitude. If you are plugged into Satan, if you are plugged into sin, if you are plugged into drudgery, if you are plugged into negative, it is always going to be negative. When you plug into the Word of God and the Holy Ghost of God, how the Bible lets us know that it is joyous because you have the Spirit of God and one of the, the part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Challenge my attitude to become like Jesus. Wow, there's also, I need to acknowledge some things in my life. And the Bible says it like this, and you can find it out there as you look in the Word. But it, it, my attitude is, God, I'm a vessel. The Bible says it. It's found in the book of Timothy. It's found in 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 20 and verse number 21. But the Bible says, if a man therefore purged himself from these things, he's talking about sin, he's talking about self, he's talking about I want in my life, he shall become an on, a vessel of honor, sanctified and need for the master's use. Hey, God, may I just be your vessel. Y'all don't really care what I do or what I don't do, God. I don't really care what's going on around my life or what's in my life, but God, I want to be a vessel that you can use. I want to be your vessel. Whether it's a vessel of gold, a vessel of silver, a vessel of clay, a vessel of a wooden vessel, God, I really don't care. I just want to be your vessel. 
God, would you use me just to deserve you? You are the only one that can determine how that you will unlock the door of being a servant of Christ and say, yes, I will. When I follow Jesus, there's that acceptance that we have. The Bible says, as you look in Philippians 2, there in verse number 7 and 8, that Jesus himself, he accepted, Lord, I want to serve everybody. I want to serve them by giving my life on a cross. I want to die for the sins of the whole world. I want to serve everybody from Adam until the last person that is born, no matter if it's Hitler, no matter if it's the worst person you have ever seen in the world with all the ungodliness of this world. I want to serve serve them Jesus accepted that service he opened that door the Bible says it like this probably one of the most amazing scriptures in the word to teach us about being a Christian is where the Bible says that Jesus and Judas are together it is the night before the cross Jesus looks at Judas. He is serving. He is washing the feet of Judas. Does he know Judas is a devil? Does he know Judas is going to betray him? I want to tell you one of the hardest things to do is to serve someone you know that is betraying you. As a pastor, one of the hardest things to do is to serve when you know somebody's talking about you. Amen? But I want to tell y'all something. Y'all ready for this? I'm not here for that. I'm here to serve. Amen. Just want to serve. Listen, what you do with service is up to you. You say, preacher, he's talking about you. All kind of people. I really don't know. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. I live in a pastor hole. I have no idea. I never hear nothing. Amen? So if you're hearing something, praise the Lord. How about telling somebody else about it? I don't want him to hear it. Amen. <laughs> Can I let you know that place of service? I don't even have to worry about the outcome. Right. Because he is, the outcome is him. The outcome is I will, God. I just want to serve you. I want to be faithful to you. God, I just want to serve you because I love you. Did you know our attitude affects everything that acceptance of I will Lord here I am it's what Isaiah said he said Lord God here I am Moses said Lord here I am it wasn't something that they wanted to do at the beginning but it was yes God I want to serve you I want to walk with you I want to be faithful to you God I want to serve you I am I will wow I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter number, chapter number 4. I want you to understand what is going on in our world today. I want you to see out of Ephesians chapter 4 uh, the effects that it has in our lives and what and the difference that it can make. How many of you remember in Acts chapter number 2 the Bible tells us uh, what happened at the first with the first church? The first church did some things that are absolutely 100% mind-blowing. Wow. But I want to tell you, it was all because of this one thing found in Ephesians chapter number 4. Listen what he says, and this is, uh, th this is in verse number 1. The Bible said, I beseech you therefore, or I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. What is Paul? He's a prisoner of the Lord. Now, you got to understand, Paul is a true, real prisoner. He is in stocks. He is in, his hands are in stocks. His feet are in stocks. He is a prisoner, literally. But what Paul is saying when you read that in verse number 1 is, I have connected myself. I have become a slave of Jesus, and I just want to follow him wherever he wants. He's my master, and I want to yield my life to him. And so he said, I, I, I therefore, for the prison of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. He said, I want you to know you have a calling on your life. He's going to tell us what that is. He said, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, here's the next word, forbearing. 
Let me just put that in good Pine Mountain terms. Putting up with, forbearing one another, not grudgingly, but in what? In love. Look in verse number three. He said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the what? Spirit. Okay, look, when you look at the word spirit in your Bible, it should have a capital S. He said, I want you to know something. You are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, in the bond of peace. He said, so I want to let you know where you are as a believer. The thing that is going to happen in your life is Satan is going to attack your unity. Okay, let me ask you something. How many in here as husbands and wives have ever had an argument before? Would you raise your hand if you've had an argument as a husband and a wife? If you're not raising your hand, you're not alive. Go get, hey, listen, let's shock these people, amen, because they're dead. You've never had an argument. You've ever in your life, just one more time as a witness, You've ever had an argument or a, let me just put it this, a disagreement. As husband and wife, would you raise your hand, please? I want to ask you something. Who started it? No, let's don't get into that. I want to tell you what happens in life. Man, what's the first thing that happens? After or while the argument's going on. You want to distance yourself. Right? Y'all don't have to answer. Y'all just answered. I know who done it now. Amen? It's like, oh, mm mm-mm. They thought we should have had great popsicles and I bought cherry. And I ain't speaking. I read this somewhere. It ain't my argument. Amen? Y'all know what I'm, it's that place where our unity just goes whoop. You can walk in unity and you can have the greatest relationships in the world for years. And then all of a sudden you went to the wrong restaurant. And it all goes out the door. They start calling Uber. You come get me. Amen. I want to tell you, unity is that place where you walk together. And if you are, if you are married, there's nothing breaks your heart more than not being in unity. As Christians, there's nothing should break our heart more than not having unity. Because we want to have what God has given us. It's that unity with Him in our life. There's four things. How many? Four things we're going to look at before Sunday school, and it's this. If I'm going to be an I will person, there's four things we need in our life very, very quickly. It's this. We've got to understand it takes unity. What if these guys and gals decide they're going to pull the other way? What if the dude in the back right here that's showing his teeth, what if he decides I'm stepping out of this? See, there's people that think, and sometimes in our Christian life, Satan will tell us that what we do does not matter. So it looks like, and I think they were, I think they were, they, were, they were winning this tug of war. They are going where they need to go. They are understanding I am a unifier. I am pulling in the same direction. They may not like how that this guy don't have a hat on. They may not like that she likes juicy fruit and she likes fruit drops. But does it change what they are doing? They are pulling together. It is that unity of spirit. Wow. 
Listen, we need to understand that God has put us in verse number three as believers that unity is essential. It is essential in sports. If you're going to play sports, you've got to have unity. Right? If it's a basketball team other than Carolina, you've got to be going down the court at the same time with each other. I don't even think they're on that, cause that session stand now, ain't they, brother? Mark, he's prayed. He's been in depression. He just can't hardly handle it. <laughs> kind of let you know if they're not going for the goal and they're not passing the ball down the court to each other for the same goal of making a goal and winning, they're not going to win. I want to tell you, same thing happens at work. What if in your factory or the place you work, you just decide, you know something, everybody's doing it this way, and this is the way they've told us to do it, and this is the manual for it, but I think I'm going to do it a different way. And I think everything they've told me is just, I, I, just, I just don't like it. I come in the other day, and man, all the, in my factory, and, and they have put new LED bulbs in, Instead of the old fluorescent bulbs, they'll go, hmm. Now they got new LEDs in. And it's just too bright in there. And I tell you what I'm going to do, I just ain't working. You say, preacher, that's silly. I know, but it happens. You're right. A unifier. A unifier is not somebody that just says, well, whatever's coming, that's what I'm going to go with. A unifier is somebody who says, God, I see as a believer, as a Christian, biblically, God, what you are doing, that you are using me, and I want to serve. I want to be part of what you are doing in life. The same thing happens in family. Oh, it, it, by the way, unity requires work. It requires work. Somebody said years ago, I, went, I think it was in a, when I was in Bible school, how they said it like this. How they, they were in Bible college, they said, I'm going to let you know something. He said, a marriage is made in heaven. How many of you believe your marriage is made in heaven? Woo! How many of you believe your marriage is made in heaven? He or she is the greatest that's ever happened in your life. Some of y'all ought to be up doing this right. You, woo Amen. You're the best. Wow. I mean, he's done it all. Oh, yeah, God made it all. But the maintenance is on earth. And the same thing, if you are saved, God saves us. He puts life in us. God gives us a heart. God gives us the Holy Spirit. And then he says, now as a believer, I have empowered you to do what I have called you to do. You are a unifier. You are one to get in unity with God. The Bible says here, use the word in verse number three, to endeavor. That means to make an effort. Wow. How come it is that everywhere we go, all things can fall completely apart, and we're still kind of okay with it, but when it happens at church, we're out. I want to tell you why, because church is the most vulnerable place in the entire world. It's the place everything should be perfect. It's the place that all people should be smiling. It's the place that everything in everybody's life should be good, and nobody should have any kind of problem whatsoever. Can I just tell you something? If you want to live in that land, you are living in a fantasy land in Barbie world. Can I let you know, church is a place of messed up people uh, with problems and sin and ungodliness and all kind of things you can think of. How about we're here for the same purpose, and that is to say, God, I need you, and God, I want you to work in my life. That endeavoring for unity in our heart. Here's how he said he would do it. He said in verse number three, he said with, uh, with humbleness, all oh, that humility should be in our lives. What he said in verse number two, he said with all lowliness, that means humility. You know what humility is? Are y'all ready? Humility is real simple. It just simply means others, that I look at others better than me. Then I realize, wow. I can't even believe God saved me. And I should have been in hell. And who am I to be somebody's judge? Or who am I to look at somebody in a different way? I'm here to serve. Man, I'm here because Jesus saved me, because Jesus changed me, because Jesus has given me life. He said, I will to be endeavoring to have that unity with gentleness, with patience. 
What if Jesus didn't have patience with us? I want to tell you something. We would all be in hell. But thank God for his patience, amen, and his grace in our life. Oh, by the way, can I just tell you something about that? The Bible said in verse number 3, he said, without acceptance of loving one another. Did you know that love is a fruit of the Spirit? Well, we're understanding something little by little, even more. The I will has to do with the Holy Spirit that lives in me, not with my want, not with my desire, but who he is and how God wants to transform my life. And the Bible says it and lets us know it like this. I am a sacrifice. I am somebody who wants to sacrifice to see what God wants to do. Wow. I'm willing to say, God. I will because I know what you can do in our lives. I am a sacrificing church member. Verse number two was that of Ephesians chapter number four. It's in that place of understanding, God, not my will, not my desire, not who I am, but Lord, what you want. It's that place of willing to give myself and say, God, I want to follow after you. Have the desire of Jesus. We read it, the mind of Christ. God, what do you think? Lord, what do you want me to do? God, what is my part as a believer? What is my part in church? Lord, I want you to help me to follow after you. Oh, it's that place. There's an example of Paul. Wow, when you think about the Apostle Paul for just a minute. The Apostle Paul said it like this. He spoke the words out in, a, in, in Romans chapter number 7 when he said it like this. He said, the things that I would do, he said, I, that I shouldn't do, he said, sometimes I find myself doing. And the things that I know that I should do, he said, I look back and I'm still not doing those. And then he goes on in that same portion of Scripture and he says, I have to die daily. Wow. God gives us that opportunity to yield ourselves for the church's sake, for the gospel's sake, for Christ's sake, to say, God, I don't know what you want to do, but Lord, I'm here. I don't want to follow you. Oh, there's those examples. Stephen in the, in the New Testament became how that martyr. How the believers at Macedonia said, we want to give sacrificially so how that these over here can be blessed in Jerusalem, these poor how saints, the Bible calls them, how, in, in the book of Corinthians. And Paul said they gave for them. I want to give you this. This is not, I'm not hurrying through this because it is not significant. I am giving you this and I'm hoping that in the book and in the word of God and by the Holy Spirit that it will catch fire in our life. And I am a prayerful church member. Did you know if we would pray about stuff as much as we talk about stuff that it would change stuff? It is a whole lot easier just to talk about it. It's a whole lot easier just to say, well, I'll tell you one thing, this, 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 rather than saying, God, I want to get on my knees because you're the only one that can change that. God, you're the one who can intervene in that. I am a prayerful church member. That's found in Colossians 1 and verse number 9 and verse number 10. It's that place of calling upon God. I want to tell you what prayer does. It is our spiritual connection. It is the place that we connect with God. It is the church's spiritual connection and power. It is found in prayer. In Acts chapter number 2, there was 3,000 people got saved in one day. How did that happen? It's because they have been a prayerful people. And they have been connected with God. Oh, wow. Can I let y'all know something? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What is prayer? Prayer is active faith. It is me believing what God said in his word. And God, I'm going to trust you with what you said in your word. But I want to give this the place of spiritual blessings. Praying so that he does not fall into disgrace. And that's what the Bible tells us in the book of Timothy, chapter 3 and verse number 7. He said, I want you to know we're to pray for each other so that we don't fall, so that we don't fail, so that we don't, we don't become acceptable to Satan, so that we don't become that one that is drawn away. I want to tell you what we are praying for. We have a desire to see blessed. Did you know if I'm praying for my church, I want to see it blessed. Whenever I think about Poovey's Chapel, yes, I believe it's the greatest church in the entire world. I believe everybody in the world should be at Poovey's Chapel. I think people should fly in every weekend just to come. You know why? The Word's here. The Holy Ghost is here. Jesus is lifted up. Amen? Amen. I think it's the greatest place on earth. Amen. Amen? And if I don't, I need God to change my attitude toward the church. 
It's the place that God, has, it's, the, it's my family, it's my marriage, it's everything in the spiritual realm. It's the place where I come uh, to worship and meet uh, with God. If I'm praying for it, I want it to be blessed. If you're praying for somebody, are you praying uh, just so that their life can go all to pieces? Or are you praying for them to be blessed? Are you praying for them so that they can keep being lost and keep dying and going to hell and keep being in destruction? Or are you praying for God to rescue them? It's that place of prayer. I'm a prayerful church member. The last thing is real, is real quick, and it is I am a joyful church member. Now, I understand it is 8.30 in the morning. I understand that. But I want to understand something else. There should be joy in our heart anytime. I'm blessed. I have a privilege to come to church. Man, I can be a joyful, I can be a joyful server. I am joyful to serve the Lord. There's two things that are mentioned. It's found here in, Ephesians, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Can I ask you a question? Does my attitude lead me to rejoicing or rebelling? Does my attitude lead me in that place of, God, I'm going to rejoice in what you are doing? I don't know what all you're doing. I don't see what all you're doing. God, I might not even like the avenue you're doing it in. But God, I'm going to rejoice in what you're going to do when I follow you. And God, I want to follow you. I want to be a joyful church member. I want to be somebody that follows, follows the Lord. In this book, it's real, it's real simple. You are a GCM or a JCM. Does anybody know what a GCM is? A grumpy church member. Wow. Man, I tell you, since the Cowboys got kicked out, old Jerry Reeds, amen. <laughs> a grumpy church member. Do you know how easy it is to be grumpy? It's easy. If y'all don't believe me, I know. Some of y'all know how to do it. It's easy for all of us to get in that place that we grumble about everything. Y'all know what I mean? If you're on a fort, I understand it, but other than that, amen. It's easy to become grumpy. Or a Dodge or a Chevrolet. <laughs> y'all ain't going to believe this. I'm going to let y'all in on this. Y'all ready for this? Y'all really ready? Sometimes at church we forget about spiritual warfare. We just want to see this happen, this happen, this happen. We forget that there's an undercurrent from Satan that tries to cause us to be grumpy. And there's a pull from the Holy Spirit that wants us to be joyful. That's what J-C-M means. Last Monday, y'all are not going to, I know y'all ain't going to believe this. I drive a GMC Suburban XL. It has 252,000 miles on it. I put a quart of oil in it every 15 miles. Not really, but it's close. I just done a simple put it in reverse. The whole transmission come out. That was last Monday. Brother Mark, driving down the road, went to pick up a, a trailer that we needed for the, for the church to put all the stuff in for the youth and all that. Driving up the road on Monday... He did not drive a Ford, and it wasn't a Chevrolet. It was a Dodge. And you know if you got a Dodge, the name of it means it all. Just Dodge it. Same day, guess what happened to his transmission? Came out. I said, I didn't even know his come out. He didn't know mine come out. I said, hey, guess what? Our transmission's come out. Praise the Lord. We're going to be like Jesus. We're going to walk everywhere. Amen. Amen. You know what? I could be grumpy or I can be joyful. You know what about church? We can be grumpy. We can choose to be joyful. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit leads us, there's joy comes out of our life. It don't mean that nothing bad's going to ever happen. It don't mean that everything that goes on in life you're going to like. It don't mean that everything that comes around me, I'm just going to say, yes, I take that with joy. But it is that I choose what God said in his word. I'm going to follow God until Jesus comes, and I want to be what God would have me to be as serving in him.
Joy is a gift, by the way. We can refuse it or we can receive it. We can be an I want what I want or I will and serve you, Lord. Let's stand together and let's follow Jesus this morning. I want to ask you something. Am I willing to say, God, I am an I will person? With every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute while we're in the presence of the Lord. I want to ask you a personal question right now.